Okay, so welcome everybody. And um, so I go. Okay, so um, I will talk today about fluorescence correlations microscopy and give you an introduction into the technique. And if at any point, as well as already said, you have any questions, just raise your hand, right? And then, then I'll try to answer the questions. I will ask you as well questions in between. So um, let me see if I can, uh, hopefully I see the chat and then uh, I hope uh, uh, you can answer some of the questions, right? That tells me as well uh, whether, whether I'm clear or not. Okay, so let's start. So uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. If you want to understand fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, there's a couple of different concepts you have to understand and you have to combine. And that's what I'm trying to do. So let's start with fluctuations. So imagine a chemical system, right? There are two compounds A and B. These two compounds A and B, they can form a complex AB, like for example, a lipid receptor, a binding system or whatever, right? And in, as in any chemical reaction, you're gonna have a forward reaction with a reaction rate constant Kf and a backward reaction with a, K, a, a reaction rate constant Kb. So there's an equilibrium between this uh, in this uh, reaction to be reached. So if we start now in a traditional way and mix A and B, a certain concentration of each together, and we look at the production of the complex AB over time, what you're gonna see is that uh, we're going to see more and more complex AB until we reach actually saturation equilibrium. So typically you measure your kinetics because of that rise. And if you look at the slope here, what you will see is actually you see forward reactions, forward reactions, but sometimes you see a backward reaction. And then you see forward reactions and then backward reaction again, forward reactions. But the forward reactions dominate. That's why you see the rise in this curve. AB is produced, right? You can describe this actually by a couple of differential equations, right? So the change in AB in the number of complexes uh, depends on the forward rate uh, 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 reaction constant um, times the concentration of A and B. And uh, complex are removed by the backward reaction. Okay, so if you wait long enough, you're going to reach an equilibrium. Equilibrium means that uh, the complex number AB doesn't change anymore. So this change is zero. So uh, this expression is zero, so what this means is it's just Kf times Ab is equal to Kb times F. But there's something important, right? If you look here at the equilibrium, you'll see that you still have forward reactions and backward reactions. The only thing that happens now is that you have as many forward reactions as backward reactions. So the total number of complex Ab doesn't change, but of course you constantly have new complex falling, falling, uh, falling apart. So while here on that slope, the, the forward and backward reactions and these fluctuations you see here determine the slope here at the equilibrium, it's the fluctuations that determine uh, 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 the equilibrium. So what that means actually is that in equilibrium, as long as you are sensitive enough and you can measure uh, individual reactions, you can measure these fluctuations and you get all the information about your chemical reaction. You do not have to look at kinetics. Kinetics you do if you don't have enough resolution to see the single reactions. But if you can, if you can see the single fluctuations, you can look at equilibrium and just look at the thermal fluctuation that tells you uh, everything about the chemical process there is to know. That's why fluctuations are so important. And of course, uh, out of this equation in equilibrium, we can determine as well your, your association constant. That's what it is. Okay, so that's why fluctuations are important. So. All we need is to measure fluctuations. First concept. Second concept, correlations. What are correlations? Now assume we have two parameters, A and B, you measure. Then the definition of a correlation is, and I give you first the definition and then try to justify it, right? The uh, definition of a correlation is that if you take the average, which is indicated by this angular brackets, of the product of A times B, if that is not equal to the average of A times the average of B, then you have a correlation. Okay, sounds strange. Let's, let, let's start with an example. Assume A and B can take only values of one and zero randomly, okay? And they take the values with equal probability. So you have as many zeros as you have ones. So first question, what is uh, the average of A and what is the average of B? 
Okay, now the problem is that I can't see the chat. Can anybody answer this? Give me a second. Ah, chat here. Here we go. Okay. So what is the average? Okay. Uh, you, so now I have the chat, but you get the first answer. I'm sorry for that. Okay. So the average of A and B, right, is both going to be 0 0.5. Why? Because A is half of the time 1, half of the time 0. So the average is going to be 0 0.5. The same uh, is true for B, right? So what is uh, uh, the product of uh, the average of A times the average of B? Now I need somebody to ask to give me that answer. That's not particularly difficult. Zero point five times zero point five is zero point two five, right? Sorry. Okay. So now the question is: What is the average of A times B? Now that's a little bit more com uh, complicated. So let's take a look at that. The first thing is you have to realize what kind of products can you form? You can have A and B can be both zero. A can be one, B is zero. A can be zero, B is one, or A and B are both one. Now all these probabilities, right? All these uh, combinations uh, happen a quarter of the time, correct? Now in all of these combinations, only the last one gives you a product of one. All the rest is zero, correct? So I have in a quarter of the cases, uh, the, the value of A and B results in one, the rest is zero. Thus, the average of A times B is actually 0.25. So that means the product of A times B, right? And the average of the product A times B are the same. So in this case, the two variables are not correlated, exactly what we did expect. I told you, right? I mean, A and B take the, the numbers randomly. Now let's take a look what happens if we assume that A and B always take the same value, right? So we know A and B, they're still, uh, the, the average of A and, and average of B are still 0.5, right? Because they're still half the time zero is half the time one. But now, uh, a and B always take the same value. So they're both either one or both zero. So what is the, the product of the average of A times the average of B? That's again 0.25 like before. But now in, in this case, in half of the cases we have zero, zero. In the other uh, half of the case, we have one, one. That's the only possible states we have, right? So that means half the values AB result in one. So the average of A times B is 0.5. And you see now that in this case, there is an inequality, right? Because uh, this side is larger than this side, all right? In this case, you would say the two values are correlated. Why are they correlated? Because actually the second value B always has the same uh, uh, value as, as the parameter A, right? They always take the same values. What happens if they have opposite values? Okay, of course, both averages are still 0.5, right? So AB is still 0.25, right? The product of uh, the averages. What is the average of the product? Now, in this case, we have only two possibilities, one, zero, and zero, one. Both of them are always zero, right? AB is always zero. So in this case, the, uh, the average of AB is actually zero. Again, the two are different. In this case, the left side is smaller than the right side. In this case, you would say the two values are anti-correlated because actually B always has the opposite value of A. Is that clear so far? If any questions, please ask. So what we can do now, we can define a correlation coefficient of small g, right? Which is just the ratio of the two, the two sides, right? The average of A, B, divided by the average of A times the average of B. And as we've just seen, we can say now if G is equal to one, the data is not correlated, right? That was the case when uh, A and B randomly took any value. If it's larger than one, 
then it's correlated. That was the case when A and B always had the same value. And if it's smaller than one, then the data is anti-correlated. And that was a case, a case when A and B had always opposite values. Now I've chosen zero and one because that's easy to discuss, but actually you can show that for any other value as well. It's actually a, a, a good exercise if you want to, if you want to try. Okay, so now we've just taken a look at uh, the, uh, A and B, uh, uh, how do they happen? So actually what, we, what we're looking at is actually um, uh, A at different times. And if we make this uh, a continuous time, right? then uh, we get now a, a correlation function, right? Of, uh, um, where we look at the A as a function of uh, time and B as a function of time, okay? So now in this case, these values, what we have just done, we've just done sums actually in this case, when A and B are continuous functions, uh, the sums are just uh, exchanged for integrals, but otherwise it's, it's the same principle as before. Now, Again, we're still looking A and B, two different values. But what we can do as well, we can look at A alone. That is what we call an autocorrelation function. Now, of course, we are not so interested uh, uh, whether A at time t is correlated with itself. Of course it is, right? The A of t is always gonna have the same value as A of t, right? So that's, uh, that of course is trivial. However, what is more interesting is what happens if I look at A of t and the same signal a little bit later, a time tau later, right? And tau can vary now over all times as you, uh, as you like. So you can look at different difference, uh, at differences in, in time. And you can see if the value of the signal is correlated to itself at a later time. If the, think about this for a moment. If this is true, if A is correlated to the value uh, a time tau later. What that means is you can predict the future. Not 100%, but you can predict it uh, with better than, um, than chance, right? So the correlation function tells you how long a, a particular fluctuation, a particular signal will last and how long you can predict how the signal is gonna be in the future. Now I'm going to int uh, introduce something that's called stationarity. Stationarity means that uh, if I take an average of A at any point in time, in, in time, it doesn't matter, it's always going to be the same. So if I measure the average of, uh, uh, of, of uh, A now, or if I measure that average in 10 minutes or in an hour or whatever, it's always going to be the same. If that is true, then of course, the, here at the bottom, the averages are the same, right? These, these averages are the same. That's what we call stationarity. That means your signal is, is, is stable, okay? Or in equilibrium. So that means our correlation function is gonna be expressed actually in this way, right? A of t times A of t plus tau divided by the average of AT squared. Now, just let's take a look for, for, for the sake of it at the sum of, of the, the properties of the correlation function because uh, before I show how it looks like. Um, so, what happens if instead of going the positive direction in this tau, I go in the negative direction? So I can ask as well, is my signal now related to the signal the time tau before, right? That is g of minus tau. Yeah. So now if we shift the correlation function in time, which we can do, right? Because we just said our signal is stationary. So I can replace now t by t plus tau, right? So we shift the whole function just by tau. So g of minus tau is then a of t plus tau times a of t divided by a of t plus tau square. Now remember that I just told you in stationarity, a, the average of a of t plus tau is same as a of t, right? The signal is stationary. So actually, as a matter of fact, that is the same as this one. And that is of course the same as our original definition of the correlation function. Yeah, can you, can you see my cursor actually? Should have asked it earlier. Okay, very good. Okay, so what that means is my correlation function is actually symmetric in time. So here on this side, I give you an, an uh, example of the correlation function. So I have here a signal, I have a signal in blue, and the yellow signal is exactly the same signal I just shifted in time, right? That is a shift uh, 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 tau we're talking about. 
and I continuously shift it, right? It can be before the blue, the yellow uh, signal can be before the blue signal, after the signal. And I do this for, of course, for the whole signal. And then at the bottom, you see the correlation function, right? And you see that the correlation function is maximum if the yellow and the blue function just overlap. That means when the tau is equal to zero. And then the, the longer uh, 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 the, the shift is, right? The less overlap you have actually between the peaks and the lower is going to be the correlation function. Right? And it tells you as well that the correlation function tells you something about this overlap of the peaks. It tells you something how long a signal uh, persists, lasts. Okay. Again, if you have any questions, please please ask. Yes, sorry. Uh, why yes. why is the correlation uh, a maximum two? I didn't get. Sorry. Oh, it's not. It's not maximum two. It's okay. Um, the the value here doesn't make uh, uh, any difference at the moment we haven't talked about the amplitude at all i just normalized it right so you see that there if you remember the correlation function when there's no correlation it should be one so at long times right the two the, the signal is not correlated with itself if you wait long enough so the, uh, the convergence value of your correlation function will be one and this amplitude is just one just because i normalized it just for the for the sake of presentation but we'll come to the amplitude in a moment and explain what that actually is, because that will depend on the particular physical process you look at. Any other questions? Okay. So, why is that important? I mean, of course, I've, sh I've shown you already that, um, in principle, uh, uh, you can say something about the future, you can, you can say something how, how, how long a, um, a signal will persist, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the correlation function is actually very powerful. That's what I want to show you on this slide. So look at the, the two uh, uh, graphs you have, A and B, right? Both of them are uh, signals. One of uh, the two signals contains actually information. The other one is random. Which one do you think contains information? Which one do you think is random? Give me any guess, any guess will do. Uh, the second is random. Okay, do you have any, any reason for, yes, okay, good. Sandeep said the same, uh, same thing, very good. Uh, yes, any, any reason why you say C is random? I can see that the, the first A uh, has like a not a equal distribution in terms of the maximum amplitude, let's say. Very good, very good. Actually, if you if you look at it, uh, fun, uh, the, the trace A has actually a sign function uh, under underneath uh, the noise. Right? So while the second uh, function has absolutely no correlation, it's completely random numbers. So very important, right? If you have random noise, or which be sometimes called white noise, then there's no correlation function. Anything else will give you a correlation function. And as you can see in from, from, uh, from uh, the example A, right? Uh, the correlation function is very powerful to extract that information. Right? So do you immediately see that you have a, a sign function underlying the signal, which otherwise would be very hard to see, right? Okay, so. How do we use that in, in fluorescence uh, spectroscopy? So the typical setup we have nowadays is a confocal setup. In a confocal setup, what we do is we have a laser that can be any laser line you like. Um, we reflect this from a dichroic mirror, and then we have two scan mirrors, so you can uh, scan your, your uh, laser in X and uh, Y directions, and that goes into an objective, and then you have here a very small focus. The so focus is diffraction limited, diffraction limited, Anybody knows roughly what that would mean for visible light? About 200 nanometers, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Elishka. Okay, so 
that means we have a very small volume, right? The volume is about 400, 500 nanometers in diameter and uh, above, uh, about, about one and a half micron or so in, in, in size. So, so we can actually really look at actually very small amounts. So this slide is then, uh, uh, the fluorescent slide that's coming from that focus is going back. Uh, it passes the dichroic mirror because it's longer wavelengths than the, than the laser. And then you have a lens with which you focus it on the image it actually on the pinhole. Uh, through the pinhole, only light will go through that actually goes, uh, is, stems from the focal volume. Uh, out of focus light will, will be blocked by the pinhole. That's the idea. And then uh, you focus this onto a, a detector. And then the detector will give you the intensity trace and that intensity trace you uh, uh, use now in either hardware or software correlator. Nowadays you, you use mostly software correlators because computers are faster. Okay, so that's a standard confocal setup. So what happens now? In our uh, uh, confocal setup, if you have a small molecule and that goes through the confocal volume, it will actually be excited, it will emit uh, fluorescence and you get fluorescent peaks, right? Each time a molecule goes through, you get a fluorescent peak. And now what we do is exactly what I've shown you with the correlation function, right? We have these fluctuations and we run our correlation algorithm, of course, not over the single single fluctuation here, but as many fluctuations as you recorded in your signal and calculate your auto correlation function. Now, if you have a longer, or this, a, a larger particle, it in principle uh, moves a little bit uh, slower, right? So what that means is you get longer fluctuations, right? Because a particle stays longer in the focal volume. Longer fluctuations means for the auto correlation function, it should be uh, depend longer on its own signal, right? So, and that's exactly what you see, the correlation function. Uh, uh, you see here, I should point out that this is plotted on a logarithmic scale, so it's more easy to see. Um, but uh, what you see is the correlation function widens the slower the particle moves, right? Because when the particle is slow, it stays a longer time in the focal volume. So what happens if you have multiple particles in the focal volume? Just I showed you one particle going through, okay. What happens if you have multiple particles? So now you have a couple of particles in the focal volume, a new one comes in and goes out again. So again, you get your intensity trace. But now what you'll see is you have actually two different things. First of all, you have an average intensity. That's average intensity should be dependent on the number of particles you have in on average in your focal volume. But then as well, what you have is these fluctuations and these fluctuations should be due to a single particle, All right? So in principle, you can, if you can compare these, uh, uh, these two, right? You should be able to get the information about the average number of particles in your focal volume. That means you get, if you know the size of the focal volume, that means you get uh, your concentration. And this is encoded in the correlation function as well. In this case, right? Uh, it is uh, um, uh, encoded in the amplitude. Now, this is important. The higher the concentration is, the smaller is the amplitude. And the smaller the concentration is, the higher is the amplitude. Now, the question is why, All right? So let's make a small experiment. Take a look at uh, the number of particles I show you here. How many yellow spots did you see in the upper and the lower blue circle? One and two. One and two. Thanks, uh, Ipsa. Okay. Now on the right hand side, how many did you see? Don't play back, okay? So, of course, on the right hand side, you can't say. Right? Why? Because fluctuations are much harder to see when you have many particles around. That means your correlation function has a high amplitude if you have few particles because the fluctuations are easy to see. But you have many, many particles, then the fluctuations are harder to see, your amplitude is going to be very low. Okay? So now let's start, take a look, and I, I skip here a number of, of uh, mathematical parts. Uh, um, but what you see here now, 
is the model how the correlation function should look like for a particle that diffuses through your focal volume. And I explain the different parts. Okay, so g of tau, of course, is your is your um, uh, correlation function. Then what you see here in the front is here. This one is uh, c is the average uh, concentration, right? The average number of particles you have and the average concentration. And this here, what you see here, uh, is the effective confocal volume. So if you multiply the average concentration with the effective confocal volume, that is your number of particles. So as I told you, the amplitude of a correlation function is just one over n, right? The more particles you have, the lower is the amplitude. So if you remember uh, from um, some physics courses earlier, right, then you know that the mean square displacement in diffusion is given by this equation, right? The average of x squared, so the mean square displacement is equal to four times d, the diffusion coefficient, times the time over which you look, right? So if you look longer time, the mean square displacement increases. Okay. That means one over t is equal to four d over x squared, all right? Take a look in the correlation function, all right? You have three terms. You have everywhere this four d over w zero squared or 4d over z0 squared. Now, here in this equation, it meant the mean squared displacement. Here in this equation, w0 is the radius of your focal volume in x and in y direction, assuming, of course, that your focal volume is rotational symmetric, which typically is in a confocal setup, right? So x and y are, have the same uh, width, w0. And z direction, right? has uh, uh, z0 as its, its, its radius, right? And you can express this z0 as just k times w0. So what you say is, okay, my, my size of the confocal volume in the z direction is just k times larger than w0 direction. That, that you'll, show in a uh, you'll see in a moment that makes things a little bit easier. Okay, so you see that each one of these is basically a uh, 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 discussing one direction, x, y, and z direction, and each one of these uh, equations related to mean square displacement. Right? So if I define now the diffusion time tau d, the average time my molecule needs to go through the focal volume, right, as w0 squared over 4d, and my stru uh, structure factor, which we had here in the, in the uh, uh, already defined as k is just the ratio of the z extent of your focal volume to the y, x y extent, right? The z zero over w zero, and the number of uh, 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 particles per observation volume n is just this c times of, of effective observation volume. If you use these definitions, then my final correlation function will just be one over n times this term, which describes uh, the diffusion in, in x and y direction, and that's the one in z direction. And then we remember that we said the correlation function at long times converges to one. Uh, that is, of course, an idealization. This is actually the, con the correlation function will converge to one if you measure infinitely long. You have a PhD project, so you can't measure infinitely long, so we come relatively close to one, but not exactly. So typically we, we uh, describe this last uh, uh, parameter as G infinity. So we fit it along in all our, in all our data to, uh, to get better fits because it, uh, the, uh, the correlation function can, the conversions can, slightly, can be slightly different from, from one. Okay, it, so are there any questions so far? best if, is, is, is if you talk or you write in the chat because I don't think I see at the moment any other signs. Okay, if there are no questions, you can always uh, talk to me later as well, right? Okay, let's take a look at an example. Okay, I just told you that. Uh, Asun? Yes. Sorry. Uh, Sandeep has a question. Uh, 
uh, he uh, yeah. wanted to know about the structure factor. Yeah. So he wants us wants you to explain the structure factor. Oh, okay. Uh, Good. With me. Okay. The structure factor is just the the ratio between the extent of the focal volume in the z direction divided by the extent in the uh, x y direction. Right. The structure factor we call it k. Some people call it s. Uh, is equal to Z0 over W0. It just describes how much longer your focal volume is than it is wide. Um, so there, there, the fact that actually uh, if you focus uh, a, a laser beam to a spot that in the H direction you have a longer extent than the XY direction is, is something that comes from optics. And what that basically is, uh, says is that if you look at a, at a particle, right, if it diffuses, it will stay longer in the focal volume if it diffuses in the z direction uh, uh, compared to when it diffuses in the in the x or y direction. Right? That's why you have to account for all three axes: the x, the y, and the z direction. And the z direction is just uh, uh, a little bit uh, longer. But of course, the diffusion coefficient is is everywhere the same, at least if, if you're in solution. Okay. Any more questions on this? Okay, G infinity. What is G infinity? Um, so if you remember in the beginning, we defined the correlation function. If the correlation function is equal to one, there's no, the, the, the two, uh, the, there's no correlation. If it's larger than one, there's a correlation. If it's smaller than one, there's an anti-correlation. Now, the problem is that of course, this, this ideal uh, value of one is never 100% reached. You're always a little bit off, right? So when we try later on, I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples when we fit our data, right? Then uh, instead of assuming that the correlation function just, just converges to one, we give it a parameter g infinity. And this g infinity describes this convergence value. Now, in all our fits, in solution, g infinity is very close to one it differs less, typically less than a percent from one. But it is not exactly one just because you can't measure infinitely long. Any other questions? Okay, then Let's take a look at, uh, at an example. So here we have uh, tau d, which is, I told you uh, earlier, that's our definition. That is w0 squared over four times the diffusion coefficient. If you look at that, what that means is that the product of the diffusion coefficient times tau d is just w0 squared over four. That means our product in our correlation, in our um, FCS setup is always constant. That gives us the chance to calibrate our system, right? Because either we know W0 already. If you don't know W0, what we can do is uh, we know that uh, the, the product of D times tau D is a constant. So if I have a, a, um, a, uh, a molecule which where I know the diffusion coefficient of, right, then I can write the diffusion coefficient of my second uh, um, uh, um, a particle just as the ratio of the, the measure tau d, tau d1 over tau d2, and times the diffusion coefficient of my first molecule. So once I calibrated my system and I know this product, I can determine the diffusion coefficient of any other molecule. That's why FCS is relatively powerful. If there's a couple of molecules we know the diffusion coefficient of, and then we can uh, uh, use uh, those to calibrate our FCS systems, and then we can measure any other diffusion coefficient. So let me give you an example. So tau d1, for example, is 25 microseconds. The diffusion coefficient of that particle is 410 micrometers squared per second, right? So diffusion coefficient is always given as area per second, or area per time, I should say. Um, and this is something which is akin to, for example, rhodamin 6 g or so. Now, if I measure tau d2 for another particle, and that is 125 microseconds, right? Then I can measure, then it can determine my diffusion coefficient of the second particle is just 82 micrometers squared per second. Now, 
as I know that 4d tau d is w0 squared, that allows me as well to calculate w0 squared and thus w0. So in this case, w0 with these numbers is just 202 nanometers, All right? Exactly as uh, you said earlier already, that would be the diffraction limit of our system. And these are realistic numbers. So this is what we typically get um, in, in our system, right? 410 micrometers squared per second is roughly 4, 4 rotom and 6g and 25 microseconds. 25, 26 microseconds is the typical diffusion time we get. Okay, but that's of course not all. If you remember, the number of particles I have is the average concentration times my confocal volume. Now I know actually every single thing in there, more or less, right? So my concentration is just n over that uh, that focal volume, or I can say that my um, uh, w zero, right? My extent in the x or y direction is just a cube root of this of these values, right? But n is a fit parameter from our from our measurements, right? Uh, K is actually fit parameter as well, the structure factor. We can fit that in the in the correlation function as well. So if I know all this, right, then I can uh, I can actually calculate W zero from our from our uh, measurements as well. The only thing I know I need to know is what concentration did I use. So you you use a a standard with a particular concentration, let's say one nanomolar, then you did, uh, uh, um, fit your correlation function, determine n, one of the amplitude, right, and K. And then you can actually calculate W0. So the question is, if K is five, which is a typical structure factor. So K is typically somewhere between three and eight in most cases in, in well-aligned systems, right? Um, let's assume K is five and my concentration is one nanomolar. What is N? No. You can calculate it later at home, but for one nanomolar, you have about five particles in your observation volume if K is five. And we have a W0 of about 200 nanometers. Okay. Now, of course, at the moment, we discussed the whole time only about uh, single particle uh, uh, models. Yeah. Of course, there can be multiple particles in the side, the confocal volume. And uh, then our whole correlation function gets a little bit more complicated, but uh, let me just explain to you, it's actually quite easy. What you see here is the correlation function for the first particle with tau d1, right? Diffusion time tau d1. And what you see here is the correlation function for the second particle tau d2. And what you have now in front is just the fraction of particles of one. So if you have, of course, more particles of, uh, of, of particle one than particle two, then of course, that uh, correlation function will dominate to some extent, right? So F here, you have one minus F and the whole thing is weighted by the brightness. So kappa one is a brightness of particle one and the brightness goes in with the square, right? And kappa two is a brightness of the second particle and it goes in with the square as well. What that means is if I have a particle two that is twice as bright as particle one, the correlation function will contribute four times as much as uh, the correlation function of particle one. So you have to watch out a little bit. It's not directly proportional. So, and the amplitude of the correlation function is then as well uh, uh, dependent on, on, on the brightness, right? So the amplitude changes not linearly with the brightness. You have to remember that. And why is it brightness? Because if you remember the correlation function was always defined over a product of fluorescence values, right? It's the average of F of T times F of T plus tau. So you always multiply two fluorescence values. That's why uh, uh, your correlation function is proportional to the brightness squared. And here's just an, 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 it, it's a couple of examples. So what you see on the left is a correlation function for two particles. And I show you here these correlations fun uh, functions for different ratios of tau two to tau one, or tau d two to tau two, uh, tau d one, right? And I always print here uh, ten functions which uh, go from uh, sorry eleven functions I think from um, both particles have the same fraction. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the first particle has a zero fraction, then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 until the second particle dominates. So the, the function here in the, um, uh, on the left is the fast particle 
the function here on the right is, is uh, if only you have the uh, uh, only the slow particle and everything in between is a mixture as you see. So you see in some cases very nice how you see actually the two to two humps first co first correlation function right and then the second correlation function the second hump you see here. So that's the ideal. On the right side is what you very often see typically in in in, in actual measurements with noise on top. But still even in these cases, it is relatively easy to fit. And if you do FCS long enough, you will actually see, even from the shape of the correlation function, whether it's a one particle or two particle model. So um, that's why FCS is actually quite powerful because it can determine concentrations, but it can determine as well mixtures and fractions. It can tell you this, you have more particles one uh, than particle two, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if, of course, you know the brightness of these particles. Okay. So to make the whole thing a little bit more complicated, at the moment, the only thing we really talked about is that the correlation function is caused by diffusion, right? A small particle going through your focal volume, and then because of that, it uh, creates uh, fluctuations. That is that part here. But in reality, of course, there's all kinds of other fluctuations. So for example, photophysics. What does photophysics mean? You, your your uh, molecule, can always blink. That means sometimes the particle is on, sometimes it's off. But because it's sometimes on and off, that means it, uh, it causes fluctuations. These fluctuations you can measure. That is called the photophysics part very often that's a triplet state. Can be other things, can be isomerizations or whatever, but uh, typically it's a triplet state, right? So where the particle goes into a long-lived dark state from which for microseconds or so, it doesn't emit before it comes back then it could be rotation, right? Because if your molecule rotates and your laser is linear polarized, then the molecule will only uh, uh, absorb and emit light, right? When it's at the right orientation. So the orientation as well will cause periods where the molecule is correctly aligned and you get emission and when it's not aligned and you don't get emission. So your correlation function will be able to measure that as well. So you can measure rotations of particles. And then there, uh, there's another, um, a part that's called anti-bunching and uh, that is a quantum mechanical effect. Actually a, a molecule can only emit one photon at a time, right? And you might know that this is typically during its lifetime. So the lifetime of molecules or fluorescent molecules is typically between one and 10 uh, nanoseconds. So once the molecule um, uh, is excited, it will stay on average a couple of nanoseconds in the excited state and will not be able to emit uh, 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 during that, uh, well, it, it will emit, but during the time it will emit only one photon. And then it gets excited again, and then again will take a couple of nanoseconds to emit again. So that means there are periods where uh, uh, you get photons uh, and they are separated by periods where I don't get a photon. So that's a fluctuation, right? So actually with the correlation function, you can measure this, what is called anti-bunching, and you can actually, in principle, measure the lifetime of a, of, of a flow of four. From these, from these correlation functions. Okay, so let me just cover a couple of other modalities which uh, make this uh, a little bit more efficient um, if, if you want to do more measurements. So uh, one way to do multiple, many measurements at the same time is when you use a camera as detector and you use something like the light sheet or a, a, a total internal reflection microscope. So you, you eliminate a cross section of your sample where the, the thickness of this light sheet or, or evanescent wave is only uh, 100 nanometers to perhaps a, a micron or so. And then if a molecule diffuses in here, it's projected onto the, uh, to the camera and you basically measure how long it takes to diffuse through a pixel. And that's the different, you know, at different pixels, at different times you get a peak because the molecule diffuses through and then we just can calculate our correlation functions again and we get uh, the, sorry, I don't know. Uh, and we, we get um, the correlation functions, the width and the amplitude of the correlation functions. And now we can determine that at every single pixel in one single measurement. So what you get is, for example, then uh, total maps of uh, diffusion coefficients and concentrations. So in this case here, what you see is that's a turf image of a phase separated bilayer. Here you see the diffusion coefficient. You see here areas where the diffusion coefficient is high, areas where the diffusion coefficient is low. And then here, that's a concentration image. 
right? So it's the number of particles you see in these pixels. And you see that wherever the molecules uh, move slowly, there are a lot of molecules. And wherever the molecules uh, move fast, there are little molecules. Why? That is because if a, a molecule comes into one of these areas where it moves slow, it just accumulates because it stays there. While in, in the areas where it moves fast, it moves fast through these areas before it gets caught by another one of these, uh, uh, of these uh, slow moving areas or more densely packed areas. So it's quite a nice um, a demonstration how we can use FCS in, in, in these cases uh, uh, in an imaging mode. And the last thing I really want to address today is, is fluorescence cross correlation spectroscopy. It's so very similar to what we. Question? Can I ask yes, a question? of course. So, yeah, hi. So throughout the talk uh, where you have shown a capital G tau on yeah. y axis, so I I am guessing that is the uh, uh, correlation over uh, fluorescence signal, not the fluctuation, right? That is a correlation function uh, normalized to the fluorescence signal squared. That's right. So so if if we uh, if, if if we look at the uh, correlation over uh, fluctuations where we uh, multiply the variance. So uh, in that, uh, our autocorrelation function will go from zero to negative value, right? Uh, why would it go from zero to negative value? No, because uh, the relations are between, uh, if, if we call this uh, uh, correlation function of fluorescence, uh, mm -hmm. capital G tau is equal to correlation function of uh, fluctuations, small g tau, then capital G tau is equal to a small g tau plus one, right? Okay. So that way, if it is going from uh, in, in all these slides, uh, so capital G tau is going from one to zero. No, the capital G tau starts at one. One, one means no correlation. And then it goes, it's above one, right? So it starts out at time zero, it's typically relatively, well, it's, it's your amplitude, right? High value. And then it drops with time because the longer, the longer you look forward, the less the signal is correlated to the present moment. So you drop and if you completely uncorrelated, your G of tau is one. Sometimes people, it, you can show, right? That um, uh, you just can basically subtract one and, and have the correlation function uh, converge to zero. And you can show that this is uh, the, the correlation function of the fluctuations. Okay, yeah. So one more question I have, where you mm -hmm. uh, showed the value of W0 as 200 to nanometer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was asking that uh, uh, that is the uh, volume which is selected by pinhole, right? That is, that is the observation volume, correct. That is yeah. a combination of the fact that you focused your laser and on top of it, you filter this by the pinhole. Yeah, so uh, if you look at the diffraction pattern when excitation uh, light is falling on, 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 the, on the sample, yeah. so there, uh, what is the uh, uh, you know, uh, aspect ratio of that diffraction limited spot? Because there are many concentric uh, 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 you know, pattern where light is falling. That's a very good point. So actually the, the pinhole typically is chosen as one area unit. So it's about just the size of the central peak of your, uh, of your uh, diffraction pattern. Um, if you make the, especially in one photo microscopy, if you make the pinhole too large, then you have actually other parts uh, of your, of your uh, emission that actually can contribute. In that case, um, uh, you get deviations of the correlation function from, from the model we've seen. Then the, we, we describe our, our observation really, uh, at the moment as a Gaussian profile, right? So it's uh, basically the intensity is highest in the middle and it falls off like a bell curve in all three directions, X, Y, and Z. If you so, make the pinhole too large, that's not true anymore. So, so the width of that Gaussian peak is uh, 0.61 lambda by Na, is it true? 0.61 lambda by Na, that's the radius of that peak. Okay, and what the is width the... Is not yeah? And what, what would be the uh, length of that uh, Gaussian peak? It's, that's, that, that is something that depends very much on how, how good your optics are. It's typically between three to eight times that width. And in a good system, it's uh, around between three to five. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So in cross correlation function, um, uh, we do basically the same thing as we did with auto correlation function, but now we use two different lasers to excite two different kind of flow force, a red and a green one, or blue or yellow, whatever you like, short wavelengths, long wavelengths. We do the same thing again. We filter it by a pinhole, but now we separate the light, the emitted light afterwards into two different detectors. One detecting the short wavelengths, one detecting the, the long wavelengths. And now we cross correlate the two signals. What's the advantage of that? Let's take a look at that. You have two particles you see here, right? And if they go into the focal volume, one is red, the other one's green, then you get actually uh, fluctuations. And you get the autocorrelation functions, right? That tells you how many green particles were there, how many red particles were there. But since these two particles don't interact with each other, there's no cross correlation because they're, they're the times the red and the green particles go in are completely random, right? There's no correlation between the two. Now, assume the two particles bind to each other, right? If they go through, then you get, of course, uh, uh, the, the intensity. And as you see here, now, because they bound to each other, the two particles actually move through the focal volume at the same time, and their uh, uh, fluctuations come at the same time. So the two particles are correlated. So what you get now is, again, the autocorrelation functions red and green tell you how many red and green particles there are, but you get as well the cross-correlation function. And the cross-correlation function tells you how many of these particles actually interact. That is a power bit. And that's you. if you look at this one, you could always get away with looking only at the amplitudes. And that would immediately tell you whether you have actually interaction of two particles or not. So let's take a look at that a little bit. So the green function, again, tells you how many green particles they are. That means that are all green as well as all particles that contain green and red labels. It might contain some crosstalk depending on your system and some background. So you potentially have to be do a little bit more to um, to calculate the, the exact values, but in principle, that's what it is. In the, in the red, you have the same thing. You have the, the red particles and all the particles that contain green and red labels. You might get crosstalk from, from the green. That's actually more likely, right? The green typically talks to the red, not so much the red to the green. And again, you, have, you might have some background signals specific to that particular channel. And then you get the cross correlation function. Now, the cross correlation function contains uh, only information about particles that are labeled with green and red. Can as well contain some crosstalk, all right? So you have to watch out and have to measure that properly, but uh, that can be done. And I'm not going to go into this, this time, but uh, that, that can be done. There's many articles about that. So, how can we determine, for example, a uh, dissociation constant, right? The inverse of the association constant we talked about earlier. So if you have the two particles G and R, right, green, red, they build a complex GR, then our KD is the product of the concentration of G times the product of the concentration of R divided by the complex GR. So that means G, R, G, R, that are the three values I get out of my three correlation functions, right? The autocorrelation functions and the cross-correlation function. So I can do a number of measurements and then plot them in a histogram and just fit it and then get actually the KD out of it. I can rewrite this equation as well as uh, the product of G times R is equal to KD times, uh, times uh, the complex concentration, right? And if you take a look at that, if I plot, um, do a scatter plot of this value against this value, I get a scatter plot which has a, a slope of KD. That's what you see here, All right? That's the line through the origin, ideally. And the data should lie along that line. That gives you a KD. Now, let me give you a very fast example that it actually works. So these are actual correlation functions with their fits, right? And uh, just to, to mention that here, you see, for example, that's MRFP, a red fluorescent protein. And you see that here in the beginning, I see actually photophysics of that molecule. That's not, that's not diffusion, right? Here I see photophysics. The second part is diffusion. So it's a very nice example where you see two different processes in one correlation function. OK, so I have two molecules, CDC42 and IQ gap, and they interact um, if CDC42 is uh, GTP bound, and they don't interact if it's GDP bound. So I have here two mutants, one which is predominantly GTP bound, and the other one is uh, predominantly GDP bound. And what you see is, hopefully, in this case, 
I have a higher cross correlation function in this case. I still get a little bit of cross correlation function here. Why? Because I have crosstalk, red particle or green particles talking to the red channel, etc. Okay. However, take a careful look. If you look at the red and the green particle here, they have roughly the same width. What that means is the two particles move with more or less the same speed, the same diffusion coefficient, I should say. Okay. Here in the second case, you see that the, the, the width of the green correlation function and the red correlation function are quite different. That means the two are not moving with the same diffusion coefficient. That, I mean, but if they don't move with the same diffusion coefficient, they cannot interact. Two particles interacting must move with the same speed, right? With the same diffusion coefficient, correct? So you see already that here we actually don't get interaction. What you see here is rather crosstalk. And you see as well that the crosstalk is, 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 is not related to the red particle. It's more related to the green particle because it's actually relatively short. Okay, let's take a look at these measurements. And I should say, again, I haven't measured, uh, mentioned it, but these measurements were actually taken in a zebra fish. So what you see here, you, we see actually the correlation, the, the scatter plot, as I just shown you. And if you measure the KD, we get about 100 nanomolar. And if you plot this for every, if for every single point we measure it, we calculate the KD and fit that, you get something of the same order, right? 80 nanomolar. In the second case, where we, I told you already, we don't get interactions. Um, I have a, a much more wider distributed number of values. It's much harder to fit with a single line. And uh, the distributions, uh, the, the, the values we get for the KD is as well pretty much randomly distributed. And uh, actually, as a matter of fact, only in a th uh, one third, only about 30% of all the cases can be even calculated. In most cases, when we try from these values to calculate a KD, we get actually nonsensical numbers, meaning either negative values or even complex values. Okay. So, so, so here, uh, here okay. we are seeing uh, uh, the autocorrelation value uh, reaching to one from one point in the first panel, 1.18 to one. In earlier, we see that it was reaching to zero. So I, I just... Typically, the correlation function I've shown up to now, I think we're always starting from one for, for look, at, at long times, all the correlation functions converge to one, right? Because there's no correlation at long times. If you just wait long enough, your signal is not correlated anymore. While at short times, they are larger than one. Yeah, but there, I also get to see some data where uh, correlation starts from zero, I, I mean, uh, starts from one and going to zero. So I don't understand the difference when correlation value falling to zero and here like correlation no, value okay. falling to one. So the, so, okay, let me, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Let me just go back to that. Give me a second, I'll be right there. Okay, so here, yeah. The correlation function, right, converges to one. Okay, and most people, not most people, it's not true. Actually, it's, uh, in the beginning, most people used actually one. Nowadays, very often, people just subtract that value of one. Then your correlation function will convert, uh, go to zero. Okay. And the difference between the two is really, you can show that, I have to go a little bit further back to that. Give me a second. Um, is really, If you take a look at the correlation function here, right? We look at the signal, right? A of t times A of t plus tau. This correlation function, the signal correlation function converges to one. That's how we defined it originally. But if instead of I take uh, the signal, I take the fluctuations around the mean, right? Yeah. So I have what what I have here is, is a delta a of t times delta a of t plus tau. So I look only about the fluctuations around the mean. Then this correlation function is exactly the same correlation function. It just converges to zero. Otherwise, there's no difference. It's exactly the same. It's just you just change the conversion value from one to zero. So you see both. Some people use the, co uh, the correlation function that converges to one. Some that converges to zero. Okay. So one more question, since you are on this slide, 
So mm -hmm. uh, you said that uh, uh, you know that uh, average of uh, average of uh, uh, the mean value should not be equal to the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, product of that. Uh, 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 yeah. The, the average of the product yeah. is not equal the, to the product of the averages. Yeah, yeah. So the simple basic question I don't understand that what if they are equal, uh, they will not, not remain correlated? Okay, if, if this value is equal to this value, yeah. what's the value of the correlation function? One. Yeah, one. But one, we know, means uncorrelated. So that comes from the definition of correlations, right? Yeah, yeah. So if these two are the, the same, right, then they are not correlated, right? Then you, my correlation value is one. But if the correlation value is larger than one, then it's correlated. If it's smaller than one, it's anti-correlated. No, so from where we came up with this uh, 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 formula that, uh, you know, average of AB is, should not be equal to, uh, you know, product of averages. Right. So what I've done in this lecture is I have given you that as a definition and then how I've shown you why it makes sense. Right. Mm. That's what we went through here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I missed this. This, this basically you can show what that means is that a, that a and B are independent. If a and B are independent, there's no, there's no correlation. Yeah, and that's exactly what the correlation, what we want to find out with the correlation. Is there any dependence of, of, of B on A or vice versa? Yeah, so that we, that because the moment we know that, right, we, we, the moment we know that B is somehow dependent on A, hmm. that means I can predict the value of B from A. So it gives me a lot of power. Uh, and in, in our case, what we do is we look at A at time now and a the same signal a little bit later so that means if there's any correlation it allows me to predict the future to a certain extent yeah that's yeah. why why this is powerful of course in our case we don't we don't predict really the future we use this to uh, determine how um, molecules move yeah. right but in principle, if you can do that, if you can do that in a, in, a, in a casino, you're going to be rich very fast. And they're going to be, well, it depends on whether they throw you out first, you're going to get rich. I don't know, but I haven't tried. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? 